this morning we are far from plants and uh, seeds and uh, but let's go back to the mosquitoes I think it's a good time now for mosquitoes <laughs> and uh, I think that mosquitoes is also a good example because everyone here knows mosquitoes and uh, in particular we will target our presentation of on uh, IDES borne diseases which cover a broad range of diseases like uh, dengue, zika, chikungunya I'm sure that you know these diseases uh, um, in terms of epidemiological cycle, we will start this presentation with some background uh, notions just to refresh your memory on the transmission of uh, vector borne diseases. Uh, in general, for IDES borne diseases, we can distinguish two, uh, in terms of epidemiology, two cycles. All these diseases are zoonoses, which means that we, we have a um, selvatic a natural cycle among primates and the virus is transmitted by mosquitoes among this population of primates and sometimes uh, in the field in the forest in some places human can be human can be uh, 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 infected by uh, this uh, by this virus and in some times it depends on the epidemiology of the disease we have a different cycle we call it urban cycle with uh, involve uh, urban Aedes, such as Aedes aegypti, Aedes albopictus, and in this case, uh, the animals don't play a role, it's on only interhuman transmission. And the epidemiology of uh, this urban epidemics depends on a lot of factors, virological factors, immunological factors, entomological factors, so uh, all these factors act together, and we have at the end uh, a seasonal and interannual dynamics of IDERS bone disease uh, epidemics. In short, for example, in temperate regions like in France, classically, we have these epidemics at the end of the summer, end of the summer, beginning of fall. Uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, a general uh, framework for this, uh, for this IDERS bone diseases. In terms of prevention or control, let's go back uh, to some uh, important notion, you, we don't that except for yellow fever, uh, you know we that, that we have a vaccine for yellow fever, we don't have any cure or therapeutics, any preventive drugs against these diseases. So uh, the prevention and control of these diseases um, is, are mainly uh, based on vector control. And uh, how conduct the vector control, it's important to know the bioecology of the target, I mean the bioecology of the, the, the mosquitoes. In this case, Aedes mosquitoes, urban Aedes, you have here some important notion in terms of duration of larval development, in terms of longevity of adult female, and in terms of duration of gonococcal cycle. Like it means the interval of days, the day intervals between two bites. Uh, some key notion of urban IDES bioecology, it's important if you want to control these uh, this mosquitoes. Uh, first, in terms of larval sites, it's really important to note that uh, you have a lot, a lot of small artificial water containers that can constitute breeding sites for these mosquitoes. It means that in terms of prevention and control, it's really difficult uh, to use larval control against these mosquitoes. Uh, classically, uh, during, uh, between, uh, during inter-epidemic inter per periods, it means when you don't have any epidemics, uh, you use uh, mainly education of population to reduce uh, by uh, some education and good communication to reduce the larval breeding sites. And during epidemic periods, it means when you have an epidemic of dengue or chikungunya or zika, you use the same uh, uh, strategy with uh, awareness and education of communities, but at the same time uh, you use uh, space spraying of chemicals of insecticides and uh, by uh, specialized teams and it's really a vertical approach. And in fact, uh, it, in most of the case, in most of the case, these old school vector control programs doesn't work. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't work. Why? By, because you, you don't have uh, really uh, 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 um, a strong impact means that 
uh, in terms of remanence, in terms also uh, on uh, residual efficacy. Uh, you have also a lot of concern about the impact of, on the environment and on the not don't target fauna, uh, including in the urban environment. Uh, also, uh, a big problem now is the resistance of the target mosquitoes to most of the insecticides. And so, uh, uh, at the same time, uh, we, you, can, you can see here that a lot of challenge regarding the efficiency of this vector control program and also a lack of evidence uh, for the, 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 let's say, the community-based uh, intervention against these mosquitoes. Recently, uh, more and more uh, publication on, on this uh, approach of the community-based intervention against CIDES and in some cases, we have some evidence that it can work. Uh, but you need a strong involvement with the communities. Uh, in terms of new tools and approaches for IDS control, you can, uh, you, you can uh, uh, read it, read, read here, uh, that uh, there are a lot of tools uh, now in research, in development against this IDS. Uh, for example, um, we, we are more um, targeting now this IDES using a, sele a selected use of insecticides, of a new generation of insecticides. At the same time, uh, there are a lot of traps under development, like uh, this sort of lethal OV traps. Uh, you have also the auto dissemination station using the bioecology of IDES that the female can carry a, bi a bio seed, in, the, in this case a pyroxyphene, <coughs> to the natural breeding site. And by this way, you can reach all the natural breeding sites of this patient, of this patient in the environment. Uh, you have also uh, the classical SIT and the boosted SIT. Uh, I mentioned this, uh, this strategy because uh, it's one of our uh, projects, uh, ongoing project now. It's an RSC uh, funded by the ERC and it's led by Jeremy Bouillet in, uh, in uh, the research unity, uh, in my research unity. Uh, you have also the Volbakia approach. I'm sure that you have heard about this, uh, this, uh, this approach. Uh, the the Volbakia approach with uh, a lot of challenges now. We have this big initi initiative called Eliminate Deng in Australia, but now uh, they, uh, they are um, implementing uh, large uh, scale uh, studies in the field in different countries using this Volbachia against IDES EGT, but also against IDES Abopictus. And there are some evidence uh, that it works, uh, not uh, including on uh, other espe species of IDES. Uh, I, I, we, we can use also this example of uh, the release of insects with dominant lethality, the RDL techniques. Uh, it was developed by Oxitec, Oxitec in UK and uh, they, uh, they, they conducted several trials in different spaces, in, in Cayman, in Brazil, and they say that it reduced the population by 95%, but uh, we, there are a lot of discussion about uh, this uh, efficacy, and in particular, the long-term efficacy of this approach against IDES uh, Egypti. Uh, in terms of challenges, uh, also, uh, it raised a lot of questions about regulatory, ethical issues, social acceptability, and uh, there are still a, la a lack of evidence that it works against the dengue infection, not only in terms of entomological parameters, but also in terms of biological and clinical uh, parameters, including the dengue infection uh, among the population. So uh, Thierry has shown you a, a variety of, uh, of uh, method and tools to fight against uh, AIDS vector-borne disease. Uh, and I'm going now to present what has more as a new development in vector control with the last technological approach, which has a lot of hype around it, which is the uh, use of gene drive. So if we go back very briefly to how a vector-borne disease uh, can spread around, you need to have humans, you need to have, sometimes you have humans and animals, as we've seen before uh, in the example of Thierry with the sylvatic cycle. You have a vector, and you have whether a parasite like, like malaria here, or you have a virus like here. And what you want to do when you are fighting against vector-borne disease is you want to break these arrows. Whether you stop the contact between human and mosquito, and you stop the spread of the, of the, of the, of the parasite, or you reduce the population of the vector, 
or you can vaccinate people, then you stop the infection of human by the parasite, or you can also stop this arrow, and which means you stop the contact between the vector and the, and the parasite or the virus, which can happen if you make your mosquito resistant against your virus. So you can tackle vector bond disease at various points, or you can also tackle them at several points in the same time. If you, it's not, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail with mathematics, but if you look at this equation for vector bond transmission, this is the one valid for malaria, but it's very similar for other, other disease. What you have here is the, you have the uh, R naught here, which is a, a measurement of the level of transmission. When R naught is very high, then it means you have a strong transmission of your disease. Where R naught becomes below one, it means your, your infection is going to fade away. And you can see here you have a number of parameters. M here, the red one, is the number of mosquito per human host. More or less, the more mosquito you have, the more transmission you will have, which is kind of logical. If you don't have any mosquito, you don't have any transmission. As soon as you have more mosquito, your transmission is going to increase. Then you have the biting rate of the mosquito, which is parameter A. The mosquito needs to bite twice. That's why it's, it comes two times. And uh, the thing is that if a mosquito bites often, then it's going to increase your transmission. Then you have the susceptibility of human. If human are susceptible to a disease, then the disease can be transmitted. If, it's, if the human are not susceptible, then there's no transmission. Then the infectiousness of human to mosquito, which is more or less the ability of the human to infect a mosquito, when the mosquito is going to pick up the parasite from an infected person. Then you have the mortality of a dead mosquito, which is here. Because if, you're, if, you're mosca if you kill your mosquito, you're increasing this parameter mu, and you reduce your R0, which means if killing mosquito is a good thing because you're going to reduce your level of transmission. And then you have the incubation period of the parasite within the mosquito, which comes here. And obviously, uh, if the parasite doesn't need to incubate for a long time inside your mosquito, then the transmission can, uh, can be very quick. If it, if it has to take a long time between uh, two blood meal to, for the mosquito become, to become infected, then your transmission is not going to be very efficient. Does that, nobody's lost? Okay. <laughs> so, um, as I said, what you can do is you can kill mosquito, reduce their number, you can play on M more or less, reducing the number of mosquito, or uh, you can also affect the infectiousness of human to mosquito, which means you can uh, stop the infection to infect the parasite of the virus to infect mosquito, so which is acting on B1 here. So, and if you act on, um, um, on the, pop you, you can then have two different approach. You can replace your population of mosquito, which when you come back to the previous thing, uh, you make your mosquito non-susceptible to the parasite, and you, or you, and you make your mosquito kill the parasite inside itself, and then, oops, you have, uh, you have, you go from a wide population of, I would say, dangerous mosquito to a population of transgenic or gene drive carrying mosquito who are not dangerous anymore, and you don't have any more transmission of your parasite, or you can have just has a classical usual tool when you use insecticide, a reduction of the population of mosquito if you decide to kill them and suppress them, and then you don't have any more transmission. And this is where gene drives came, because this is, this is the, these two ways, replacing or suppressing population or reducing them, can be done with classical tools. But gene drives, because of all the information that has been gathered with the development of CRISPR-Cas9, has been permitting to think uh, about <coughs> this replacement or suppression of population in a very quick manner. If you are familiar with uh, classical genetics, with the Mendelian genetics, if you have a modified gene, a classical gene, you just modify it, or a normal gene, is going when the, uh, uh, your modified mosquito is going to mate with the wild type mosquito, each parent is going to pass on one chromosome to a pair of, its of a pair to its offspring, and basically half of its offspring are going to be uh, carrying this modified allele. Then it's going to spread to the next to the next generation, uh, and so on, and it's going to spread very slowly into the population of mosquitoes. Now if you use a gene drive inheritance system, you have this CRISPR thing with your, which are more or less molecular scissors. They're going to uh, insert the gene of interest or cut the gene you want to disrupt inside your mosquito. And it has a, the gene drive has a function to copy this uh, gene of interest or to uh, repair the, 
the, the, the other chromosome as the one you have been modifying. So now instead of having just one modified chromosome here, you're going to end up to have a mosquito who has two modified uh, two, two modified allele. Okay, so the, 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 the mosquito is going to spread to to give his offspring uh, um, two only a version of the modified allele. There's no way he's going to give a, a classic a, a normal mosquito. So obviously, because there's nearly 100% inheritance of this modified uh, system, you're going to have your gene uh, or modified mosquito carrying the gene drive system, spreading very rapidly into your population. Okay. So if you go back to this uh, uh, equation, the way you want to reduce your, the force of the infection uh, and then the transmission can be done through the infectiousness of humans to mosquitoes. So acting on the B1 parameter here. And this is the way you're going to make your mosquito resistant to uh, malaria, to a parasite. It can be malaria or it could be dengue, for example. So you are replacing your population of mosquitoes who are able to transmit a, vac uh, a disease. And you're going to replace it with a population that is not able to transmit this disease. And you can do it quite quickly because of the gene drive approach that permits the spread of the allele of interest into your population. Obviously, there are some limitations to this method, even if it appears very, uh, very high tech and very sophisticated. Is you're going to have, a, you're going, you need to reach, a, oops, you're going, you need to reach a very high frequency uh, of resistance in your population. So you nearly have, you need to have all your vectors resistant to make sure it has a real impact on the transmission of the disease. There's obviously often a, num a different number of species who are transmitting a disease in a given location. This can be Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus transmitted dengue in a, in a given region. For malaria, for example, in Mali or in Tanzania, you can have sometimes four different species of mosquito transmitting malaria in a given location. So if you change only one species out of four, you're not going to reduce the transmission to zero. So that's an important thing to consider when using gene drive approach in the field. And obviously, the efficacy of refractoriness. You need to have a very, very efficient system to kill your parasite. Your mechanism for refractoriness needs to be able to kill all parasite, whatever the diversity, genetic diversity of parasite is going to encounter. And it also it needs to work in many environmental conditions. It needs to, to be able to kill the parasite, even if the mosquito has not been fed very well. Because obviously, you're not in a lab where mosquitoes are feeding ad libidum at the larval stage and at the, at the adult stage. So these are important points. And obviously, the, the microorganisms, the environment that the mosquito is going to live in, are going to influence the, uh, the expression of this uh, gene, gene modification. And the other approach, as I said before, is a reduction of the number of mosquitoes by human host, so playing on the M factor. And obviously, when you, want to, when you have your reduction of population, what one of the major advantages you can have is that once you have been able to uh, remove your mosquito from a population, First, you remove the wild mosquito, which is obviously a good point, that's what you want. But also you remove, you don't leave uh, in the population uh, genetically modified or gene drive carrying mosquito, which is also a good point because you don't leave any GM uh, organism uh, flying around. But there is obviously some limitation because now you have an empty niche. If you remove, for example, Aedes aegypti for, from a given place, you might have Aedes albopictus coming and playing around and keeping the transmission high intensity. Obviously, uh, the efficacy of reducing num mosquito number is not the best way to do to uh, reduce uh, 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 the transmission of the disease because if you go back here, if you're playing on the, if you're decreasing the factor mu, you having, you divide mu by, for example, two is more efficient than dividing uh, M or B1 or B2 by two because mu appears two times. It's similar if you're playing with the factor A, the biting rate of the mosquito, because it appears two times in the equation, it's more efficient to divide it by two than any other factors that have a linear relationship to, to the level of transmission. So this is also an important thing to consider when you are uh, willing to decrease transmission, is how much halving a factor is going to affect your transmission. And obviously, gene drives, apart from the biological uh, aspect we've seen before is a novel technology. 
it's possibly highly transformative. It's relying on mosquitoes. So in terms of logistic, it's kind of easy because you just have to release a box of uh, modified mosquito and you don't rely on people's ability or skills to work in the field. Uh, but it's loaded with ethical dilemma because it's a releasing GM approach. It's going to spread in the environment. So the question of gene drive for vector control does not look exactly just like science. It's look more like technology and all the social studies go around uh, uh, social sciences. And uh, there has been very little, for the moment, discussion about the, the governance on, on CRISPR and especially on gene drive approach. And uh, this is from a report from a, a, a master student in the UN. Oops. Uh, so she has been thinking about the way of, of uh, governing uh, the governance on gene drive. And basically, you, have, you need, obviously, a question of risk assessment to make it uh, very thoroughly. And there's a lot of knowledge gaps that scientists can fill. The, the need also to work with funding agency, and we'll just see just after the role of funding agency, the role of industry, the role of the promoters of the gene drive approach, but also the question of regulators and the question, the Im important question of the public in terms of, uh, of use of, of gene drive uh, insect. So uh, one of the recent developments was a publication in December uh, 2017, last year, in Science of a paper called Principle for Gene Drive Research, uh, where the author uh, listed about five different, uh, five different major points, five different principles, which were quite valuable and quite uh, laudable. The, the, the gene drive research should advance quality science to promote public good, which is kind of obvious, promote stewardship, safety, and good governance, demonstrate transparency and accountability, engage with the community, with the affected community, especially especially because when it's question of malaria, it's towards the, the countries of the south, and then um, the, the question of strengthening capacity and education. So they were promoting uh, a real transparency around these things, and just to uh, so the author were from uh, from Canada, from the FNIH in the US, from the Wellcome Trust in the UK, and also very close to the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, who are really the uh, leaders in financing the, the the research on gene drive, with the uh, DARPA, the American the American Agency for the Army Research, and in the same time, just a couple of days. Uh, separated, there were the release of what has been called the gene drive files. I don't know if you've heard about the gene drive file, but it was a release of a trove of emails, uh, which is a legal thing, which is a freedom of act information in the US. Uh, and the, in this trove of emails, there was a, a revelation that there was been a coalition between the Bill and Melinda Gates and a variety of, uh, of researchers working in this field of gene drive uh, in order to uh, favor the uh, the, the research and the work on gene drive and to stop the request from a moratorium and the, at the Convention of Biodiversity. So the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation spent through a private public relation company $1.6 million in order to influence the debate at the Convention of the Biodiversity to avoid a moratorium that was requested by more than 160 uh, organizations like the Organization of Scientists for the Society or Via Campesina, for example. So there is, a, there is a kind of a problem between uh, promoting transparency and openness, which, as we've seen this morning, doesn't mean much openness, not to say nothing, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and what's really happening uh, in order to favor the governance, which is mainly driven by the, the actors and the ones who are promoting the, the research on gene drugs. This is a real uh, problem. So overall, the, the, there is obviously a question of ethical there, is, there are ethical issues with, with gene drive approach. There is the question of distributive justice. Who is bene who, who, how the benefits are going to be shared between the one who are, who are going to develop this approach and the one who are going to have release done in their back garden, more or less. There are obviously patent issues. We have seen this morning there is battle between different institutions, mainly in the US. Uh, and there is a need for proper information and communication in a real two-way dialogue with the communities <laughs> where gene drive might be used whether as a, as a trial or as a, um, as, a, as a public health tool, for example. And obviously there is a question of public perception, which is very, very often reduced to just an exercise of public communication by the promoters of gene drive. It's basically, it's, it's, it could be considered as some sort of propaganda and making people accept the eventual use of, 
genetically genetically modified mosquitoes, but there's no real two-way dialogue where people would have uh, a real voice to their concerns. And obviously there is and some sort of obsolescence of the current regulation because the technology goes so fast that the, the, the rules, whether the national uh, legislation or the regional one, have difficulties in being implemented. And there's a problem also on liability because if something wrong happens with gene drive, who is going to be responsible and how are they going to be uh, implementation of uh, compensation measures? Thank you for your attention. Thank you.